Welcome, one and all. Sisters, brothers, fathers, mothers, to another one of my special wizard tales. Camelot. After a long reign over the legendary kingdom of Camelot, King Girdlack was facing the last minutes of life. Arthur, my beloved son, the fate of Camelot rests upon your tiny shoulders. He sighed. With his last breath, he ordered his trusted royal magician, Merlin, to take the baby and raise him as his own. Hide him well, my friend. Warfare and pestilence will follow my death. Take also my sword, Excalibur. In 12 summers, Arthur can claim the sword and return peace to this land. Goodbye, my son. May God be with you. He continued into a whisper as the light of life faded from his body. With the aid of his magical powers, Merlin escaped with Arthur through the dark tunnels deep below the castle that led to the mystical and powerful Stonehenge. Then, with one magnificent throw, Merlin plunged the sword straight into a solid rock he who removes the sword from the stone will become the rightful king. And my boy, in 12 years hence, I pray that it is you who plucks Excalibur from its granite home. He proclaimed. Merlin then slid right through one of the solid rock pillars into his home and introduced the new baby to his jealous old and nasty owl. <coughs> Kirkland, who immediately decided that he did not like Arthur. Merlin called upon the magical powers of the wizard pool to foresee the fate of Camelot. A burst of light exploded from the pool that revealed a series of images of the upcoming darkness and gloom as multitudes of warriors from other lands invade and destroy Camelot. The silvery liquid in the pool rippled as it continued to reveal images of Arthur's childhood, his constant battles with Turquin, and a time when he would find a young refugee named Cynthia and her animal friends, Bali the Badger, Humphrey the Hedgehog, and Tittermite the Mouse. Is that really how you found me? asked Cynthia as they gazed into the wizard pool. By the time Arthur was 12 years old, he wanted nothing more than to be Merlin's apprentice. He practiced his magic, but not very successfully. Simba, Zamba, Zomba, Zace, Goblet disappeared to another place. He recited, and with a wave of his magic wand, the goblet was still there. Oh, what's the use? Merlin will never let me be his apprentice. I'm useless. He moaned. And when the glow of the wizard pool indicated that Cynthia was the chosen apprentice, Arthur was devastated. Still not knowing the importance of his own future, he packed a small sack and decided to leave. Merlin, you and Cynthia are my only family. I leave with a heavy heart, but I must go to find my destiny, declared Arthur. Although they begged him to stay, his mind was set. And Merlin could not reveal Arthur's true destiny to him, for he was bound by his vow to the king. Arthur would have to claim the throne rightfully on his own. Take great care, my boy, Merlin advised. Turquin, however, could not have been happier. <coughs> As Arthur walked out through the rock, Merlin quickly devised a plan to protect Arthur from any future danger. Cynthia, you must follow the boy and make sure he comes to no harm, he instructed, and immediately transformed her into a beautiful falcon. Cynthia, you must not reveal your true identity to Arthur. 
guard him with your life. He continued. A young page named Runcible just happened to be playing in Stonehenge when Arthur appeared through one of the massive stones. He walked through the rock. How did he do that? Thought Runcible. Just then, Cynthia appeared magically through the stone and landed on Arthur's shoulder, knocking him backward onto Excalibur. Runcible couldn't believe his eyes. The sword moved. First the boy walked through the rock, then the bird flew through the rock, and now the boy moved the sword stuck in the rock. The sword which has never been moved, he exclaimed. I wonder where you came from, asked Arthur, admiring the falcon. <laughs> a stranger, eh? Like me. Well, I need a companion on my adventures. And off they went. Quickly, Runcible leaped onto Excalibur. With all his might, he tugged and he yanked and he pulled so hard that he flipped off backward. But the boy with the falcon could move it. Oh, tell Sir Baldrick. He'll know what to do. Assured Runcible to himself. Sir Baldrick was a short, fat, and sloppy, self-proclaimed leader who lived in a run-down castle. Runcible attempted to awaken the sleeping beauty gently, but got no response until he screamed right into his ear. Sir Baldrick! Sir Baldrick woke violently, swinging his sword back and forth, knocking over everything in range until he spotted Runcible. You! You! You fit poop! You, you dare awaken me? He shouted. Runcible was so excited, he rambled on about what he had just witnessed, but Sir Baldrick was not listening. The room suddenly lit up with a fierce explosion of white light. They ran to the window and heard a powerful voice coming from the direction of the mysterious light. People of Camelot! The great day is at hand. Come ye forth to Stonehenge on the morrow, rich or poor, noble or commoner. The voice rang out. The almighty voice belonged to none other than Merlin. Crowds of citizens and warriors gathered at Stonehenge. Merlin explained, This is Excalibur, the legendary sword of King Gerdlach. It has been prophesied to me that whosoever shall remove this sword from the stone in which it is trapped will be the rightful king of all Camelot. Each clan is required to select a champion. The champions will be brought to this place at noon tomorrow, and whichever champion removes Excalibur, he will be king. Merlin then disappeared into a cloud of smoke. Runcible jumped up and down in excitement when he realized that it was here that he saw the boy with the falcon move the sword. But he could not get Sir Baldric's attention. Sir Baldric just couldn't wait until tomorrow. I, Sir Baldric the Magnificent, do hereby announce that I am king of all Camelot and he went to grab the sword. It wouldn't budge. Now every knight in the crowd wanted to go at the sword, and a struggle began. But not one was strong enough to claim Excalibur. The boy with the falcon moved the sword last night. Runcible repeated one more time. Sir Baldric finally grasped what Runcible had been trying to tell him. You simpering simpleton! Why didn't you tell me before? We must locate this super strong youth immediately, if not sooner. He shouted. Arthur was rudely awakened from his peaceful rest by Sir Baldric and his thugs. Cynthia quickly attacked Sir Baldric in defense of Arthur, which caused Sir Baldric to swipe his sword furiously through the air. This angered Arthur, and he stomped on Sir Baldric's foot as he exclaimed, Leave my falcon alone, you bully! Now Sir Baldrick was enraged, and he raised his sword to Arthur. Luckily, Runcible stepped in. Sir Baldrick, we need him! He can remove the sword. Runcible reminded him. 
so they dragged Arthur away to Sir Baldric's castle. Bolly, Humphrey, and Tittermite rushed out from the bushes. Cynthia, are you all right? asked Bolly. Poor Cynthia was still a little confused from the fight when she suddenly realized that Bolly was actually talking to her. You can understand all of us now, and we can understand you, Humphrey explained. Cynthia was grateful for their help and quickly headed off into the sky to follow Samuel the Sparrow, who was already following Arthur. Follow me, my friends, she squawked. At the wizard pool, Merlin was about to monitor Arthur's every move and then help him by using his magical powers. Just as an image of Sir Baldric's castle began to appear, Merlin left to fetch his supplies and ordered Turquin not to disturb the pool. When he returned, he found the wizard pool completely upset as the spiteful old bird climbed out of it. Its plan was ruined. Back at the castle, Sir Baldric was not convinced that Arthur could be the chosen one. That stripling is so scrawny, I doubt if he could move his own limbs, let alone a magic sword, declared Sir Baldric. He decided to give him a test of strength for proof. First, Sir Baldric ordered Arthur to bend a heavy sword. There is no way! This steel is half an inch thick! You couldn't bend it! challenged Arthur. Then Sir Baldric brought out a huge javelin for him to throw, which he couldn't toss more than a few feet. And for the final test, Sir Baldric commanded Arthur to pick up a large trunk filled with gold. Are you joking? That thing must weigh a ton! Arthur exclaimed. Sir Baldric was deeply puzzled. Are you don't happen to know any magic, do you? Uh, some spell that would uh, perhaps give you the strength of ten men? He asked. Arthur laughed hysterically. Throw this lion worm into the tower room! Sir Baldric ordered furiously. He then ordered Runcible to be thrown in with him. Now that they were on the same side, Runcible tried to apologize for any bad things he may have said. Fine. I just wish I knew what was going on, replied Arthur. Just then, Cynthia and Samuel flew to the window. Cynthia spoke to Arthur in a human voice. Arthur was surprised and elated, but also a little angry that Merlin would send Cynthia to look after him. Cynthia tried to explain. Arthur, Merlin knows you have a great destiny. You must escape from this place. Arthur's ego was still quite hurt. Great destiny. Ha! What great destiny? There's nothing special about me, he proclaimed. Runcible then explained that he saw him move the sword, which meant that he was the chosen one. But you must be at Stonehenge by noon today to claim Excalibur and the kingdom of Camelot, added Cynthia. Just then, Sir Baldric entered. Pretending to be merciful, he informed them that he would not kill them. He would let his dragon do it. Guards! Take these two ingrates to the dungeon. They will make a very tasty snack, he ordered. The guards threw them into the dungeon, where only a metal gate separated them from their fate. As the gate began to open, Arthur released Samuel from his pocket to fly off for help. The dragon's roar became louder and louder as he approached the gate. Stay calm, Runcible. I, I can fight him off, assured Arthur as he picked up a stick. Runcible grabbed the stick from Arthur, waved it in front of the beast, and threw it past him. The clumsy dragon ran after the stick, brought it back, and ate it. I didn't think that game could last too long, exclaimed Arthur. He then picked up a big rock and threw it right at the dragon's head. That only made the dragon angrier, and he breathed out a great blast of fire. Finally, Cynthia and the gang arrived with a key. They nervously tumbled through the door, and Humphrey rolled right under the dragon's foot. The beast spied Humphrey and tried to stomp on the poor little hedgehog, but didn't expect his sharp quills. The poor screaming dragon backed off in pain. I did it! <laughs> I beat the dragon! <laughs> Humphrey shrieked and off they all escaped to Stonehenge. 
The contest had already begun at Stonehenge. Sir Baldrick was just about to exercise his strength when Arthur arrived. Halt! That sword is mine! He ordered. Be my guest, you puny infant. There is no way one such as you could possibly remove the sword. Sir Baldrick responded. And then, in one smooth, easy pull, Arthur removed the sword from the stone. Merlin was relieved. Hail, Arthur, King of Camelot! He screamed. All the crowd cheered, except Sir Baldrick, who lunged at Arthur. Immediately, the animals came to Arthur's defense and knocked Sir Baldrick right off his feet. And so it came to pass that Arthur returned to Camelot and restored the beautiful castle to its former glory. Cynthia was transformed into her beautiful girl self and took Merlin's place as the court magician. Arthur's animal friends were all given a home in his royal court. Even Runcible was pardoned and appointed royal advisor. As for Sir Baldric, he was banished from Camelot and never seen again. And to ensure that no knight would ever abuse his powers again, King Arthur built a special round table at which all knights could sit as equals. Camelot was again a happy place for all. All that is except for poor Turquin. The poor old owl caught a cold from diving into the wizard pool and would not recover for 150 years. another fine wizard tale concludes. Sisters, brothers, fathers, mothers, join me again soon for another classic tale, won't you?